yes we we begin the recording now because i also i i use a little if there's something funny that happens before the show begins i use that okay. of course just a little like Ooh. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to a really, really special episode of the Faithism Project podcast, season two, episode two. Uh, my name is Alan Katz. I have always been grateful to Hebrew School for making me the atheist I am today. And my name is Randy Lovejoy, and I am excited to lead people on a journey outside of the church and inside of the faith. Well, there you go. <laughs> And I'm excited today because, you know, something tends to happen to many of us by the time, you know, you're, you're our age, which is you have children who are not children anymore. So, uh, yeah, yes, they, they, they have their own zip code. It, yes, yes, they do. They do. And, and sometimes their own planet. <laughs> well and that's what i'm excited about because i think you know having uh having one of uh each of our children uh on uh with us and having kind of a cross-generational conversation to me that just multiplies the possibilities oh gosh where this thing will go you know? now we should do a little bit of just you know for people new to us, new people in the audience as to where we all come from and why why we're doing this and why this yeah. Yeah. why this means so much. All right. Randy and I knew each other socially first. Uh, our, our sons went to the same uh, elementary school in, in Silver Lake in, in the, that part of Los Angeles, uh, a school called Ivanhoe. And uh, you know, like I said, we were social friends. Randy was the pastor in the Silver Lake Community Church. Uh, just funny, I, I didn't know that that's what his job was until I, I had known him socially. And, and then, you know, one day he kind of dropped that. And as I've said before on this podcast, to me, that just made him sexier. <laughs> in, 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 in a very, you know, in, in, a, you know, in a regular kind of a way. Uh, but it, it, we began a series of conversations. Yeah. Uh, in between, you know, just parenting and, and having our kids in the same school and, and, and uh, having our kids on the same athletic teams and, mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff. We began having lunch together and having a conversation about you know, spirituality as opposed to religion and everything attached to it. And, and this podcast is an outgrowth of, of that conversation when suddenly we couldn't have the conversation anymore during as the um, as the pandemic began, we kind of turned lemons into lemon daiquiris and sure. started having a podcast instead. And yeah. Yeah. here we are. Well, yeah. since we started having this conversation 16, 17 years ago, well, our sons have have uh, have grown right along with us. And yeah. of course, Lucas just graduated from yeah. where did he graduate from? Uh, NYU. Yeah, NYU and and Tristan is just in his fifth year. He'll he'll explain at uh, University of California Santa Cruz. They are remarkably different people from uh, when you and I first when met. First met, yeah, yeah. That's right. But rather than talk for them, which can only get us into trouble, <clears throat> we'll we'll let them speak for themselves. Yes, let's do it. So let's invite him in. Uh, so Lucas, who is my son, and Tristan, who is Alan's son. And here they are. Hey, Lucas. Hey, Tristan. I thought you were going to put us in a uh, breakout room. I know. I thought so, too. I thought oh, so. Yeah. It would have been better. You could have talked or something. Huh? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but then we wouldn't have gotten the material if you guys reconnecting. Um, you guys were just true. saying been a while since y'all have reconnected right yeah so we were saying since like did so did you go to i can't remember if you even went to marshall nah did you yeah yeah so uh, that's where so middle school was the last king was the last that's a while it was like eighth grade that's a long time yeah and you're looking yeah. good <laughs> yeah did um like you went to King? I don't really remember who, um, like, your friend group was and stuff. Was it just from Ivanhoe, like, with um, Lucas, Aiden, like? 
Yeah, um, it was kind of like the 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 Michigan mosh of like Ivanhoe and like Franklin kids. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Kind of was my friend group, but um, yeah, yeah. I, I I don't know. Never fully identified with like groups or nothing, but like yeah, I guess I guess I it would have to uh, put me in that one. But um, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. Uh, no. I feel like that was kind of you too. Like we were both kind of like people who like kind of. How, how how did you end up where you ended up, Lucas? Uh, well, I didn't want to go to college in California, and there Why? were some options. Why? Why? Because I wanted to um spend like time just um by myself on the other side of the country to kind of. I think immerse myself, like try to build my own um, living conditions. Sure, sure. While, while my parents are still paying for them. <laughs> but now that I'm out, now that I'm out, I'm doing my own thing. But it's kind of funny how like they're still supporting me in every way. But I'm like thinking, oh, I'm you know I'm on my own. But no uh, matter. <laughs> it it it, yeah. it it takes a while to actually fly on one's own. Yeah. But, yeah but that's that's okay if 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 one can if one can do that there's that's that's not terrible you know hopefully right tristan uh, now you when you ended up at santa cruz that was that was uh well when you were at ivanhoe i think the was it at your on the day that, that you left ivanhoe that that last little ceremony everyone had to predict their their future and and as a it was a fifth grader you predicted your future was going to be what catching a wave at santa cruz yeah it's, it's you're going to be at santa cruz now, no of course, way yeah 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 i got the video to prove it and everything yeah <laughs> that's crazy. but also but hey wait i i gotta say that is not the most remarkable thing that came out hannah barricat said she was going to be an olympian so yeah. Let's be real yeah. here. That's true. He yeah. shot a little higher. That. That, that, that's true. Let me, let me, I, did let me explain I didn't realize they were passing that passing out witches that day. I, I should I would have. Let, let, right, let me explain for, for, for the podcast. <laughs> let me explain to our for our podcast audience. One of their schoolmates uh, at at Ivanhoe Elementary School is a, a, a really talented, smart, uh, athletic uh, young woman named Hannah Barricat, and she uh, she went. Did she, did she go to Brown? Well, yeah. I think, so, yeah. I think Brown and she was a runner and she couldn't get onto the American team, but she was able to make it onto the Palestinian team because her dad is Palestinian. And so Hannah Barakat went to the to the Tokyo Olympics as part of the Palestinian team and she ran. And she and she, she kind of that in in elementary school. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. No, that was she would literally talks like she was always talking about being an Olympian. Like, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Whereas I think like Lucas, if I'm remembering right, you know, you had a few colleges you were looking at, some different ones. NYU wasn't like, like necessarily top of the list. Um, but then once you visited, that was kind of where you started to think, ah, maybe this is the place. Is that right? I wouldn't have applied if you guys didn't hire um Julie. Yeah. 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 Helped you kind of apply some different places, and then, but what was it about NYU that that made it stand out for you? Uh, is the only school that wasn't just all lectures because I don't, I did not want to learn that way because it doesn't seem that conducive to learning, and it didn't seem that it would help me do what I wanted to do. I didn't know that I was going to go so hard entrepreneurially, entrepreneurially then, but it stood out to me because it was the only one that was unique. I mean, so, Babson was too, but NYU is just way better because well, it's in, it New was York City, in the like, city too, right? Which yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. was a little more on the suburban what? And only one percent. Sorry, real quick. Only it, Babson. Their main thing is entrepreneurship. Only one percent of people actually graduate as entrepreneurs is what it said on the pamphlet. So that was kind of what convinced me to not go. Okay. No hate on Babson. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, like. 
Yeah. What so so being in entrepreneurship is is something that that's important to you. What why why? Well, I think both my it's pretty natural. Mom and dad are entrepreneurs. Hmm? Hmm. I used to sell. I used to sell in middle school. I would sell for five bucks. Like I would draw people's names on a you know like graffiti style, whatever, and just like try to sell it um and i've always been doing that kind of stuff i had some like underwear company in high school and you do. yeah yeah but I, I really just made that for the common app because it made my common app look really good um <laughs> to be honest and then but now i still now the do truth it. comes out <laughs> but yeah so i don't know i think i imitate my my parents somewhat but I, it's just more fun that way so I, I would love to hear from both of you. I mean, so what are you guys up to now? I mean, how would you describe like what you're doing now? Um, uh, you want to go first? Um, what am I doing? Like, <laughs> well, yeah, like, um, just, I mean, what, where are you? Do, what stage are you? What step are you in kind of in your life right now? I mean, whatever it is, just broadly. Um, an anxious stage for sure. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, I don't know. I, Still figuring um, it out. Yeah, no, really figuring it out. I, I, I kind of chose a path that. Um, what are you studying? Start, start, start with start with the uh, a, a couple of hard details. Okay, so I'll yeah. So so I came to Santa Cruz to surf, which <laughs> really like yeah, as as basic as you can get. It really was just about surfing. I only applied to three other things. Um, so I get in for that or not. For, <laughs> I got in on waitlist, but I got in. And um, but while there, I discovered the History of Consciousness Department, um, which was created by Angela Davis. And um, yeah, I to put it, I, I like to. This is the way, like I put it. I can explain like what I mean. It subjectivated me, like it very put, like it, it, it like this is definitely it's a religious kind of experience, per, you know, um, in a sense because it, yeah, it, it changed my trajectory. And I couldn't, yeah, it, it made me go a certain way because I couldn't uh, disengage from what I had learned. Mm -hmm. So now I'm kind of on that path. It's a path where I'm not really sure like what to make of things. And yeah, I just kind of, I just kind of think I've, I'm spending a lot of my time thinking about, and this is a project me and my dad are working on thinking about thoughts and just kind of thinking about the way we think about things. Um, yeah, just trying to pull things apart and make sense of a lot um that's kind of where i'm at i you know there's not really it's a bit daunting and it feels like sometimes i'm in an ocean and i'm just like well i don't you know um but you know i want to find like a it's project okay to be in an ocean right i mean that, you know it is okay it is okay help. it is okay to be in an ocean it's a special time as well making it's just, a, a surfing joke yeah as you know it, it yeah. was a dad joke though that's the problem all my but i grew up with you so i caught the humor wait oh Maybe shoot, I, okay, wait, too. go rewind that rewind that what did i didn't even No, you said it's an ocean and i said well as a surfer you you oh. like being in the ocean right so that's well absolutely you know yeah there's a lot of yeah um true well i think it's a joke but i think it's also a fitting metaphor and um yeah i do i am still surfing surfing is also um there's aspects in that which i'm trying to um think about kind of politically hmm. um so yeah you this said is surfing kind of where... in a political context yes what does that mean uh so um so the problem so there's there's an inherent like scarcity in surfing there's only so many waves that will break in a certain day and at a certain point so there's a politics of who catches what wave and so there's a lot of things, that's something people don't realize about surfing is like, it's really aggressive, like really, really aggressive. These, they, a lot of times, a lot of these surf spots aren't even in a place, like sometimes they are like, you know, very populated. Sometimes it's kind of off the grid. So you just see a uh, very insane aggression. Being a surfer is just a very, yeah, it's a weird thing. Um, and it's, it, it coincides with accumulation um, with people who are able to live at the beach and who have done so historically or whose family has, you know, earned money and just the way that then those people feel entitled to a certain spot uh, and feel that they are local, you know, which is the language of like nativity or like belonging to kind of justify their aggression. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a lot of politics and politics even kind of, you know, in itself for itself, like uh, is affected in and through surfing. 
such as like, you know, you could look at like Santa Cruz, like there's a huge homeless population, but surfing is also, there's a huge population of surfers. It's just like the population of haves and have nots, a lot of ways to look at it. Um, so. Aren't there a lot of like, didn't surfing come from have nots or not have nots, but people that just lived on an island doing their thing? Well, yeah, yeah, no, that's the, that's the other interesting aspect of surfing is how has it now become in, in, in the imaginary, something that is, uh, you know, like a white, you know, a white sport or like something that like rich people do, as you're saying, yeah, it comes from um, Polynesia, like ancient Polynesian islands, if I'm not mistaken. And um, yeah, they had their own hierarchies. There's probably still kind of uh, rules about water etiquette, but it's, it's very particular in this day where, so to me, the strange thing, particularly about surfing is it, it goes against hierarchies so right so i imagine like and this is again maybe talking a little bit on my ass but i imagine right so paul you have like an ancient kind of like hierarchical tribe or something that is constituted outside of the water and then the surfing kind of makes sense you, you know it, it uh mirrors what happens on land um but that is not the case with surfing nowadays you can get screamed out by little children <laughs> you can get like there is no hierarchy of anything i'm not standing by hierarchies at all but it, it is a, a bizarre, um, a bizarre thing to where it's, it's not really about who you are anymore. It's just about who well, you are. Well, people, know. people uh, love to, like on land, people always say, oh, kids don't respect their elders. Like, you know, maybe we're just saying like the same thing on sea. To some extent, to some extent, there's also the aspect of kids. It's only been a recent kind of thing that kids have been allowed to be in a lot of lineups. Um, there's a lot of aggression towards. So, no, I'm not, you know, I'm not. Yeah, I'm not saying like I'm not against uh, kids. It's kind of more about teaching people like. The innate qualities of like having other surfers out there in the lineup instead of like teaching them that like, oh, like any wave, that's just yours. Like I'm just kind of pushing for more of like a. uh yeah egalitarian kind of like hey like this is inherent in surfing why are we like why is there an issue here with aggression and and yeah um you who are um i'd just be interested tristan and in hearing you know who are a few people that you either read or listen to podcasts of or or that sort of thing that you're in in kind of all your thinking and and that sort of stuff yeah so um so i'll, I'll so the person who like like as I said, subjectivated me was Bob Meister, uh, Robert Meister. Um, really, really amazing thinker. Uh, he, he's one of your professors. He's one of my professors. Um, I've now sat in on like two graduate level courses. I'm sitting in on one right now. I've kind of like taken a step back from it. I'm kind of re, uh, thinking about whether I'm actually taking anything from it or just kind of not at all. Um, it's tricky. It's really tricky, but, um, so yeah, so that's, so it's kind of the curriculum of Hiscon that's kind of got me in this way. And so the problem, it, it's, it's both a good thing and a bad thing, is the problem with the Hiscon department, in my opinion, it lacks like a horizontalness to it. Um, it. It doesn't, they're not trying to take a bunch of different like walks of life or like they're really kind of like distilling it down into very main kind of um realms of thought but they just take such a deep vertical dive and that's the thing i love it's like they just go down so so deep so you know um some nietzsche's some some thinkers i said nietzsche's some thinkers i've been uh, liking a lot late leads nietzsche nietzsche um heidegger it, it really just kind of depends on like who i'm working on that week i <laughs> i'll be like oh i kind of you know um lost the week Hegel speaks a lot to me. Um, I, I was really liking Thomas Aquinas, 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 never know that. Um, yeah, there's a, a lot, mainly just like the kind of in the uh, scope and uh, canon of like Western stuff, unfortunately, but that's kind of where it's at. Very cool. Very cool. Wow, that's interesting. I was looking, I've got his uh, page up, Robert Meister. So interesting. Looking yeah, I did the same thing. Yeah. He, <laughs> I, one thing I saw that just came up and said he believes justice is an option. That sounds interesting. Yeah. That's so that's that's what we're working on right now. It's with the whole idea of that is justice is an option. He's meaning it in an economic sense, like an option and a put. You you're a, a, an entrepreneur, so you should you probably know what he's talking about. It's like an option. Mm -hmm. um, I, it's just I'm a nice not, 
a, a really nice title though i know i dude because of the, you, the it, double meaning there no dude I, that's what i'm saying like if you and like the, i'm trying to get through the book it's it's a fucking hard read but like um You're not talking even about heidegger bro like i don't know if oh, you yeah. can get much harder than that true that that is true that is true um but it, it's, it's just right along there with just like oh man like i don't know but um yeah it, it really the title is amazing so he's just yeah, that, that's a whole, that's one aspect to his thought that I love. It's the financial. He has this whole work he's kind of doing. Um, and this is the class I'm in right now. He's trying to understand capitalism through financialization rather than commodification because commodification is like way, I don't know, it's just old, it's outdated. And the other thing I love is his critique of uh, human rights discourse, which I think is just really um, spot on. So those are the two kind of, realms that i really like right now he also you know does classes on other things but those are his kind of things that as far as i know he works on um he was also not to go on too much but he was also trying to create a cryptocurrency um with a bunch of other people in sf called common coin um and the way it would work was that the longer you hold on to it it actually uh, deaccumulates in value so holding it is not good it's mm -hmm. meant to be spent Huh. as a way to deal because he's trying to deal with problems of accumulation like how do we at a time when now all of a sudden everything is so uh, non-existent you know like the economy or like the market you know mm -hmm. so things can be disaccumulated really easily as they are accumulated really easily so it opens up a time for possible uh yeah change or stuff <laughs> to me like actually for people our age and millennials based on you know the data accumulation of wealth is super hard oh yeah yeah oh my god yeah, like, yeah. the thing is if if you if we didn't have our parents backing it's just so much like we wouldn't be able to even think of house ownership in the future or like or if we do, like, it's got to be much, it's going to be much harder. We're in a new generation. Yeah, you got to be thinking outside the box. You can't way be outside. Just, yeah. Ah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, and this is, this is a new, you know, I'm sure you guys can, the older ones can speak to this. Like, this is a new thing. Like, it didn't used to be where you were so reliant on your past accumulation on your potentiality in life. Like, you know, it totally rests now on what happened in the past. Um, and if you have when, that jump start or not, when 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 I graduated from college in 1981, it was still a time when there were big corporations like IBM, Xerox, uh, and it was not unusual that you know you would graduate from college or maybe you'd do a couple of years at, at grad school and then you would go to work for an IBM or a Xerox or or ford or or any of the, these big companies and that would be you your working life and then at 65 they would retire you and you'd have your pension and, and like your japan life was, pardon like japan oh yeah 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 i mean yeah you, a company man you you know we, we still do company men and hey you know uh the reason that we have uh employer related health care health insurance it's not care insurance is because during the Second World War, uh, the, the, the government wanted to take every available dollar and put it towards the war effort. So you weren't allowed to give raises to people. You weren't allowed to to uh, pay anyone more money for, for, for the same job. Oh. And so what, what, what big companies had to do to try to hold on to people that they liked or to lure them, they would offer what was called hospital insurance. insurance. In case you went to the hospital, they would cover your host, some of your hospital costs. That's, that's interesting. Just got to button. That's really interesting because you're, you're saying like, um, that's, that's kind of the new age of like, it's a promise, right? They can't, yeah. that's what, that's all, you know, like they, they can't offer health care, but they can offer you a financial instrument oh, well, yes. so you well, can yes. take care of yourself, you know? That, yes. That, and that's, just, that's what, that's yeah. what it always was. It was never health care. It was health coverage, health insurance. It's not the same thing, but, but we, you know, it, it was, it was expected people in my generation it was not unusual to think you would you would you would step out the door of of your from your education into your employment and that would be how it is now because of what i did for a living i i've lived my entire life uh, in a gig economy in essence you know i've 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 the only ever times i've ever had the luxury of a paycheck is when i was doing a tv show or a feature film 
otherwise it's 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 the gig economy so to a degree as i see the world turning more and more towards a gig economy <laughs> i can appreciate the horror most people feel it's it's pretty terrifying but that said that's that is the world that 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 you that you two are unfortunately heading into it's there are no promises at this particular moment of anything your employer really you know they're they're they they don't want to cover anyone's health insurance well, they don't want to pay your your pension they don't do any of that stuff it's not it's not even it's 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 that and it's the fact that like um there's a change in like as i said like commodification and as such as asceticization uh, uh, like a break where um there's now people right who see houses as places to live as a commodity and people who see houses as a place to invest yeah. one the it's house owner sees their thing depreciate and the person who owns the asset sees it appreciate similarly with like college um it's now on a contingent upon the person who goes to college to take all the financial risk um when that you know it's like i'm in it no longer like am i investing in myself i'm not like an investable thing it's 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 not it's yeah it's i'm not making my point super well but i just think it yeah it's a new way to let me let me let me introduce a whole a whole other subject. Uh, you Wait, know, can I, I make one comment? Oh, sure, sure, sure. Please, please. Two comments. Comment. <laughs> First, just in terms of the conversation, I was thinking historically, like go back a couple hundred years. Uh, it actually only mattered what your past wealth was, and there is zero upward mobility indeed um like True. you know imagine if you were born uh carnegie or uh part of the rockefeller family versus if you were born in uh pittsburgh like mining town or something like that so um you know in the middle term we might not have the the greatest prospects given inflation and some other things, but in a bit of a longer term, we're still, it's still pretty nice. Um, okay. Wait, and then right. oh, one, just one more thing, one more thing. Um, so to use like options again, um, like in a gig economy, me being someone that's like trying to do the entrepreneurship thing, gig stuff, if you look at it like an option, if you're if you're working in a gig economy, your upside is uncapped and your downside is uncapped. You can have ten million dollars in your next gig, or you could be sleeping on the street. As opposed to working for a company, you're only going to be getting a certain amount plus a bonus depending on how hard you work and if you're in a nice firm. So there's also a uh, positive. Oh, uh, to there, that, there are, even though it's like much less secure. Absolutely true. It's oh, there's risk. You know, there's reward for all that risk. Yes, yes, precisely. Oh, there, precisely. Oh, there absolutely is. It, it's precisely you. You you can, if you can, imagine that better bout and that better mousetrap. And whether you're telling a story about it, or singing a song about it, or painting a picture of, of it, as 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 you do, Lucas, or 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 whatever. However, one can sell that mousetrap well the 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 really cool thing about what the internet has done in the in, in and connectivity is that it it opened up so many possibilities that never existed before in essence one doesn't have to work for a big company really to create opportunity for oneself I mean, there are there are people, there are influencers, influencers who are making an incredible amount of money just for having an opinion about things. It's actually usually a non-opinion, I would say. Well, yes, because an opinion might get them fired. I'll exactly. second that one, Tristan. <laughs> and I think, of, you know, the, all of this shifting and changing and, and movement toward where entrepreneurialism or the gig economy uh, is now much more of a populist thing. Like it's available to a much wider part of the population than it was before. 
is good, but it's also destabilizing, you know, of what we've had previously. And I think we're seeing that in all aspects of, of our lives. It, it all feels a lot less stable, um, which is, both, true. Uh, you know, kind of a crisis and an opportunity, um, you know, and that's why, you know, uh, Lucas, I've been really happy with, with the world that you're getting experience in um, through your entrepreneurial work, because I think that's those skills that you're developing now are going to be required for you in the time in which you live. Because I think the, the destabilization, while it's been going on for a while, you know, you could trace it culturally, maybe back to the sixties, I don't know, in the U S but the, I think Bretton Woods, maybe when we got off the gold standard. Yeah. Right. But, but I think that's going to continue. It's not like it's done. You know, no. I mean, we've got a long way to go with the destabilization and sure. of whatever is emerging after this and all of that. And I think For sure. in the meantime, you know, we're going to have to be pretty live and adaptable uh, to make it through. Because if you just, you know, just like in World War Z, you know, a movie that I, I turn to for a lot of my philosophy, uh, you know, <laughs> he, he makes the point that it's if you stay in place, you're not going to survive. But it's if you keep moving, then you'll be okay. You know, yeah, and, uh, you know that, that actually kind of is relevant to life today. Yeah, if you sit still, the zombies will eat you. Exactly. Exactly. Everybody knows that. Right. <laughs> I know. And it was Brad Pitt that said it too. So I mean, again, it's it's that's high level philosophy for me. If it's Brad Pitt and World War Z, hey. I mean, forget Heidegger. I mean, forget Heidegger. <laughs> now, <laughs> Lucas, you 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 came from uh, a religious family. And Tristan, you came from an irreligious family. I mean, in a sense, di diametric opposites. Has no wait. What's the difference between non-religious and irreligious? I was going to ask about that too. <laughs> but that word sounds cool. Is that like flammable and inflammable? <laughs> there, there's well, there, there's there's there can be one can be non-religious and kind of yeah whatever or irreligious and it's a pox on all their houses that's right that's right that's right. you know that's that that's sure. the difference it's okay it's the difference between you know just an atheist and a hostile atheist <laughs> Got it. irreligious being a hostile one <laughs> uh, yeah you, uh, yeah i gotta agree with that <laughs> one <laughs> but you know it's, it's funny we we had a guest during our first season uh, a friend of uh of I think a, a family friend of, of yours, um, Randy. Yeah, uh, our, yeah Dave. Our agnostic. Uh, yeah, that was Dave, uh, Jessica's dad, Lucas. Yeah, he knows he knows Dave too. And and it was interesting having an agnostic on because really what 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 I think we all agreed is that agnostics are really the most honest people of all because their response is, well, I don't know. <laughs> Whereas you know you know Randy commits in one way and I commit in the other way and. You know, there aren't just two options here. There are three. There is an I don't know option. So I guess the question that that I want to I want us to talk about now is considering where 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 you came from, Tristan, and where you came from, Lucas. Did that did that? How did that impact where you are now and what your thinking is about this particular subject? If you think about it at all. Today, this morning, I um. I passed out these uh, little poems that I printed out on the train. It says on the top, it says, Jesus loves you. And then it says, you were once a young child with dreams to fly. Um, turn, uh, take a deep breath, look upwards, endless is the sky. And I just passed them out on the train today. So that probably says all that I need to say about that. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, but, but let's, let's go at it. So, so what do you, what do you feel that you, your connection is to it? What, where does that play inside your head? Whoosh. Well, it's, um, it's pretty much everything I would say, mm -hmm. um, you know, because one of the main things for me is that I, um, my the way I'm the way I'm making money is kind of risky like I don't have you know I'm I'm kind of down I'm pretty I, I don't have a ton of savings right now because um I had a show 
uh, in October. In and October. I'm having, yeah, and I'm having another show in December. And yeah, I have money in my business bank account, but I can't use any of that for myself because then I don't have any money to put in for my next show. Right. So like, I, I would be super anxious if I didn't know Matthew 6, 25 through 34, which is look at the grass, look at the flowers, look at the birds. They don't care. They don't think about what they're going to put on or what they're going to eat, but they're super beautiful and they're always well fed. And, you know, those verses guarantee me. And I'm so thinking about this a lot because I was writing about it yesterday. Um, you know, why am I going to be nervous when I have all these skills that humans have? And I'm that much more able to provide for myself than, you know, a flower is. So, uh, well, plus those verses guarantee that God will take care of those needs for me. And he does. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I didn't have that, I would be super anxious right now. But uh, so so, so, so the religious education that you got in your home is, is still very incredibly important to you. Great base. Great base. Okay. Great base. I, not like, not in like a debating sense, but I always kind of felt like, um, I kind of wish I was like a flower, or like grass. Cause then you don't have to feel the anxiety, the anxieties, the excess from like all this extra shit, like that we have to bear like consciousness. Like why, <laughs> why can't I just be a flower or like a, and sure. go along <laughs> yeah how, i know what you higher mean higher consciousness sucks yeah that's i guess so like yeah shit. really <laughs> Sometimes, well, like in it? a tongue-in-cheek way or like in a tongue-in-cheek way I, I, no i don't know higher I, i'm not like I, not not all the way tongue-in-cheek like yeah higher consciousness isn't great i don't know like well look at us like we're pitiful in my opinion I don't know. You don't I, have to be though. You know what I mean? Like you can do whatever know. you want. No, you're right. You're right. That and that's why. That's why again. I guess gonna segue into. That's why I do. Even coming from an atheist kind of house household, I actually do find a lot of interesting uh, things in uh, Christianity, Judaism, a lot of religions. Um, probably not for the same reason. It's kind of more of a political leaning, I guess. But I just see. I, I think there's a lot of. Like, for instance, like, um, I did, like, a, a write-up on, like, Genesis, and that was, like, Old Testament, so that's not even, but I, I just found there to be a whole lot of um, truth, like, things that I just felt very connected with in some of those passages, um, the duality of, like, you know, like, God creates the world in, like, you know, seven whole days, but then he also creates it instantly, um, you know, and the paradox of, like, you know, why do you need, like, a farmer to, like, set up all this you know like well, I, why do you need him to plant something if he's already gonna make it instantaneously but that to me it, it just perfectly describes the uh the contradiction of our existence of like of coming and this is a heideggerian thing you know like coming into the world and like existence comes before us and we're like you know like how how is our actuality real like this is you know there already is farmers who are planting things you know so it captures that dual mechanism of like the unfolding and at the same time the instantaneousness so I think there's just a lot of things like that where I, I think it's brilliant. And um, yeah. I mean, I think that's the, the thing, you know, and, and I think Alan, I've talked about this, but it's, it's crazy that even stuff like Genesis is still around and is still translated and is still read because it's old, you know, and there's not that much stuff. I mean, heck in publishing, if your book's around 20 years after it's published, that's like a major victory, right? It's like, this is speaking to people. Then if you go back to 400 years, say, then you've got a really small cadre of books that are still being printed after 400 years, you know, but then you've got this, this, like a whole set of books that have continued to be passed down and translated and read by people all over the world, um, you know, and, and, and by a group of people that are like, you know, not super dominant historically, you know, it's like the Jewish people got overrun by how many different oppressive regimes that, you know, the, the Persians, the Babylonians, the, the Romans, you know, but it's like, these were the people that came up with this stuff that, that people still read and take seriously. And even like major philosophers, like Slava Zizek, you know, the guy, that's, <laughs> I mean, that guy, he's written stuff on Paul, you know, in the new Testament, you know, and it's like, these people are engaging this stuff in their high level thinking. 
And to me, just that alone is crazy because that does, it's not like that happened a lot in human history. It's like there, there aren't many texts that made it that. So, so I love hearing you say that because it's like, I think they do speak. Well, you things. would. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm, I'm a little biased now. But no, well, I think it speaks to stuff that's in the human heart or in the human psyche that's deep, deep down. And it's, yeah. uh, you know. So. And I also, this is, this is, um, this is kind of Robert Meister's point. Um, but just like I, he makes just a really interesting point about the uh, similarity and connectivity of the feel, you know, like just uh, Christianity or just, you know, theo, uh, theo- theology. Theolo- theology. Oh yeah. my God. The- <laughs> theology and the environmental movement. Hmm. Um, you know, as like, oh, you know, who's going to save us? We need to save us. You know, we're too, we're too we're too it it all has to do with like temporality we're too late we're too early you know um we you know just a lot of the same kind of language uh is used um and it's it's really interesting it's really interesting i feel like that's the new kind of theology is like eco theology um which is which is weird and it kind of has a his philosophical lineage which i'm kind of slowly like figuring out like it's not like needs to be figured out like i'm just figuring it out for myself but uh, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. um and it has to do i feel like and j- this is just uh, the, like the heliocentrism and i was talking about this with you dad but just like yeah just the way we perceive ourselves in the world um as being in the center or being on the outskirts yeah um yeah that's kind of where we start like because I, I always love the story of like that that sometimes really little kids if you're playing hide and seek with them they think that if they close their eyes that they're hiding Mm. because oh i've closed my eyes so they can't see me because again that's that's where we start i mean that's how we have to start biologically right but it's but then it's like over time we that's how many of us continue that's right (laughs) and then there yeah and we call it narcissism when you uh continue to live that way as an adult but but like hopefully you know you start to figure out oh wow i'm not the center like i thought i was there's actually a whole reality out there like you've been saying with the farmers that were planting before we existed you know and all of that it's like there's all this stuff going on and we're kind of dropped into a story that's already been going on for a long time yeah and it takes us a while to figure that out and and the more we figure that out the healthy we healthier we are but you know there's a lot of times we don't want to learn that so it's like i like oh, thinking no, um i really like thinking about all these you know, I would go so far as to say like pseudo religions that are popping up as in the West, as you see um, traditional time tested ones, not even just Christianity um, kind of go by the wayside. People think, well, this is my bias, too, but it's like, you know, people are like, OK, you know, this one, we're past it. And you pick up a bunch of different things. It could be your uh, political leaning. It could be climate. It could be um something to do with like race or uh income but you essentially make that you try to make that your religion but then mental health really soft um this is kind of like my thinking here and maybe there's gaps so if you guys want to like help me out or like fill in but you know, you know since those religions don't actually have any saving grace to them there's nothing that's actually oh you're forgiven in this way, you're forgiven in that way in terms of climate or whatever, people's mental health really goes down. And then you look at mental health in the United you're, States over the past long time, and it's pretty bad. You're, you're saying that people are treating these things as a religion. Correct. But then that they don't have a capacity for the kind of forgiveness. Yeah, that any does. Like, yeah. even if you're thinking about buddhism hey like you know you're gonna spend a lot of time in silence and a lot of time introspecting and then you're going to come to a deeper understanding of the world or um you know i don't really know hindu too much but like at least or hinduism like at least there's some gods you know that you can unload some of your worries on obviously it goes way deeper than that but there's no such thing in terms of uh climate or the other other issues i named before so it becomes very stressful well if 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 one were to actually treat them as a religion yeah i I, that that would be true if if one were 
to do that in in, in the strict sense. Yeah, that, that would be right. true. And we I would wager religion. that tons do tons. But what does that what does that mean? Like a religion? Like we gotta like what what is what is a religion? What makes a religion a religion and something else not a religion? Something you like place a value system you place your identity in. I feel like. Okay, but that anyone can. I place my, you know, so that's the whole problem you're saying is you're getting pseudo religions because people are putting, there has to be a higher definition of religion if you don't want there to be like pseudo religions. You see what I'm saying? Like, no, like. Do you, do you draw a distinction, Lucas, between spirituality and religion? Yeah. Okay. Oh. So one can be spiritual without being religious yeah yeah i just more mean like i didn't mean religious necessarily in the strict sense i just mean if you're really fought like earlier tristan you said oh this was a religious experience for me because it really deeply moved you and like changed your value system in some way or your identity and i think like many things that we put um in that level of power have the same effect on us that a traditional religion would have um if that makes is, any is, sense is worldview too generic of a term but it's almost like your way of making sense of the world and your place in the world is at least at least what i'm thinking of is that is that everybody's got to have a way to understand reality and their place in it and so you know there's a way that you could call that your religion if, if you're using that definition of it's it, this is how I understand the world and what's right and wrong about the world and how we fix the world and what my place is in the world. Um, and so then there's a, a Christian take on that. Um, and there's a, you know, uh, Jewish take on that, a Buddhist take on that. And then there are these other ones that people are kind of constructing a little more recently, or even bits where people kind of take some of Buddhism um and then tran you know just bits and pieces of it and put it together into something versus the full-blown buddhists could um, could could we say lucas that you have an aversion to golden calves <laughs> well i mean if i i do i mean in the context yeah, yeah. in the context yeah, i of, I, I, of I think as i listen golden. to you i i think what, what you're really what bothers you is when people bow down to golden calves that they have no business bowing down to I think it's just they don't provide the same benefits. Well, either, it's though. a golden calf. Of course, yeah, a golden yeah, yeah. calf isn't going to provide any benefits. It's a golden calf. It's not. It's not the real deal. But I Fair do. Enough, I, I, I like the comment about not having a way to handle forgiveness because that that is something I feel like in a lot of the conversations our culture is having. That's the part that's really unclear. Is like how do we make amends or how do we find forgiveness or how do we you know deal with the past and then move forward you know and it just seems like there's a lot of that in a whole bunch of the conversations we're having in, including climate or race or, yes. or or all sorts of other things um you know and, and i think it isn't you know it isn't clearly defined in our culture as a whole like how we do that like, you know, because you don't just go to the priest, you know, and confess or you don't. It, it's like, so what do you do? You know, I mean, how do we how do you make amends for the thing, the ways that we've fallen short in the past in this country? Or how do we make amends for the things that we've done to the environment? Or how do we, you know, and it to me, it's like none of that's clear. It, and there's sometimes it's it's just. I don't know, but it fe seems like there's a lot of angst out there because that missing piece that, that right. that's the thrust of what I was trying to say. Yeah, you know, how, how how we're dealing with with the past is let's as, as we as we go to wrap this up. Let's oh, wow. The, that's well, quick. Let's, let's, well, it's you yeah, know, I feel like we just got into the thick of it. No, yeah, <laughs> I, as 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 I my gut is that this will not be the first time the four of us do this last time. Last time. Yeah, this this is this is this is the first. <laughs> no, one. no, we're talking about the past, Dad. Remember? Oh, sorry. Right. <laughs> so yeah. We're we're you know we you know we we try to keep these to to about an hour, and we're we're heading into that territory. So let's let's finish I, off I, this this talk, talk with a, with a, a question about the future. Oh, okay, fair enough. Well, can I just quickly say, like, 
Of course. It, it, it's kind of a very Who basic. Who to say no? I uh, um, <laughs> Just kind of a basic, I feel like this is also what draws me to religion is because I see that same issue. It's the past. That's the issue is that like yeah. we are dealing with issues that we haven't even figured out like, yeah, it, it, like again, I, I, I read Heidegger last week, so now I'm all hung up on him. But I, he, it's the question of like being like we've just taken all these assumptions and now we're all here trying to use these assumptions and bloated words and ideas to get us out of things. And we just don't see the actual construction of it mm. or that list that's what i think so that's where you know um and yeah that's what that's where i actually like <laughs> and you know talking about like kind of going against like where kind of stand against kind of like i don't want to say like progressive but just this idea of like moving forward moving forward science progressive technology like no like stop with all these assumptions we've drawn in and we need to go back and like yeah think it through so that's where i connect with y'all mm. I, I gotta just throw this in because i i was just having a conversation one of my previous meetings here with with a, a woman in her 70s and she had just been in a book club uh talking about justice and at the end of the book club she said they, they said what are you going to do you know what's what are you going to do now what action are you going to take and she said well i really need to read some more before i decide what i'm going to do and she said everybody like had this stony look and, and and at one point they said well what are you going to do or are you going to be like barbara and just keep reading you know but it was this thing about action for the sake of action yeah and to me it's like i understand that but at the same time just taking action without like really figuring out what action is actually going to make a difference is pretty nuts you know and it can actually be really destructive and oh. um, so it just you made me think of that because uh, she mentioned that. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of interesting. Well, well let's 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 let, let let's let that be part of how we ride this out. What actions do you guys imagine yourselves doing as you head into in, into the future? What what? Yeah, what what actions, Lucas and Tristan, do, do you see yourselves performing? Because yeah, I mean, Alan and I, we're pretty much done with our lives. So we're thinking, <laughs> you guys toast. have a lot of years. Toast, ahead. man. Toast. <laughs> I, um, hopefully, you know, if the lease goes through, I'm opening a, a gallery for three weeks in Tribeca. Okay. Um, and like in the past, yeah, I had been painting a lot, but I tend to just pivot wherever the doors open. And right now it's for being a curator more and like just owning a gallery. So, um, yeah, if, if the, I'm, I'm planning to open December 3rd, you know, I've been waiting on the lease for a long time, like three weeks, four weeks, which it takes a long time because it's real estate. So hopefully if that happens, I'm going to open it up. I'm going to have um, furniture, clothing, paintings, sculpture, fragrance and just like free snacks so that people like the vibe and, and then in the in the uh basement um opening an nft gallery because i have a bunch of friends that um know some no artists that are doing well mm -hmm. uh we got a screen sponsorship for that and yeah i don't want to go off too long here but you know most of the nights i'm going to be having events like djs come in musicians come in host it for a night um so yeah i'm just really excited because there's so many things you can do with the space that's um big so i'm really excited about that that's awesome to hear t what are you thinking <laughs> damn <shit>. uh, <laughs> um i don't know you know to be honest like yeah action is one thing um well you're you're, you're working on it, something right now you know it's kind of funny it's kind of funny because it's like i don't really want to like I guess like my action right now is like being in school and just enjoying that. But what I see it as is more, it's just like time to think before I have to do an action like work or like, you know, um, to me, I don't, I, yeah, I, yeah, I really, I, it really has to do with just kind of, um, just kind of thinking my way through things still more. I, I feel like I'm not done. Um, uh, thinking or, and I guess no one ever is, but just, I, I just think this is a time in my life where action is for, I, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I'm, I guess uh, I, it's, it's a not tough the question time for action. What? It's not the time for action. Not for me. I, uh, it's also kind of hypocritical because that's like a good critique of like, you know, humanities, politics, ecological movement. It's never the time, of course. Um, uh. But, you know, I, 
yeah, I just, I, I want, I'm just going to take the time right now to, to think. And I feel like that's a real privilege, especially with um, things. I think last thing I'll say, the interesting thing with like action versus thought, like we're talking about like, you know, like NFTs, like, um, you know, it's, it's about like the implicit becoming like explicit. And that's kind of like, you know, like even the under, like, yeah, I don't know. I guess it's just the kind of a thought, like that's the way it's always understood is that like implicit becomes or it's understood before it becomes. So I'm still trying to understand before well, I can become. I mean, the cool thing about the time of life you guys are in is it's a time where, where you have minimal uh, responsibility in the sense that you can experiment, you can think, yeah. you can figure out your way forward. And it's a super cool time of life. I mean, it really is. And, and, and you know, I'm not sure if I'll get to revisit that time of life you know, I don't know. Oh, you, you're starting a new business right now, aren't you? Yeah, yeah. But it 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 feels like I've got like all these other responsibilities, though, along with it. So it doesn't feel quite as free a, as it did uh, earlier. Mm. But no, I, you're right. I mean, I'm still getting to try all sorts of new stuff and and all of that. Why? But, but, you know, so I think enjoy it's all I'm saying. I mean, that sounds yeah. awesome. Go for it. And it makes a lot of sense. I mean, we need people that have actually thought deeply <laughs> um, you know, as well as people that are acting, you know, but even better people that have thought deeply and are acting on the basis of deep thought that, that, that's what we really need. And it doesn't <laughs> happen overnight. You, you have to actually right. read all the damn Heidegger and it's <laughs> well, not just, yeah. <laughs> oh my go, God. Yeah. Yeah. Go even beneath Heidegger. There's, there's farther down. It's like Moby Dick. No one reads Moby Dick. Oh, stop. <laughs> Right. That good thing well, about Heidegger, you know, you read him once and you've you've read it all. You just it's like <laughs> no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It's like it's and like he's not coming once. either. He's not yeah. showing up. It's like you read a paragraph and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> and it's like, all right, I gotta go back and read that paragraph. Oh no, yeah. <laughs> uh, th this was this was every bit as good as I think you, you, you and I thought this was going to be, Randy. I, I thank you guys, Tristan and Lucas, for for agreeing to do this. Like I said, I, I have a sneaking suspicion this is not the last time the four of us will will put our heads together. I think we should clear like a two hour period next time. Yeah, surely, surely. Oh yeah, oh, it, it's you know this it's is kind of robbing. The <laughs> but 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 this is why you have to go and, and make the next podcast because you never you never. You can do multiple. Podcast. Cut it in half. Put the intro in. Yeah, there you go. That's but right. we and and I do cut them all together. So as you'll see when when you watch this, I I, I cut the cut it between the gallery shot and and the single shot, so it looks all pretty. And then, oh, know. nice. But also and he takes some out, music if, in. If any of you said things he doesn't like, he edits that and just removes. Oh, right. it. So he, I he I, I will think in something that. <laughs> and then there's the laugh trick. That's right. Oh. Laugh. That's right. Uh, Thank you, everyone, for, for, for tuning in to this very special episode of the Paytheism Project podcast. We'll see you all next time. <laughs> yep, see you then. Bye.